Um, it's probably one of the, okay, it is the most confusing thing we've covered so far. There will be some questions on the test, but I don't think that the questions are as tough as like the knapsack type of questions. So I was reading some more in that book, and there was a big old chapter about the knapsack in there. It was funny, um, uh, Merkel and Hellman, you know, that's who wrote it, hopefully you all know that. Anybody know that? Well, they, uh, they put a, a deal out. If you could break the knapsack, you could. Uh, it was a, a deal in the paper that if you could break it, they would give you money. Well, no one ever broke it. But then they finally went to a conference, and they said if you could break a single knapsack, which is a, a portion of it, they'd give you like $1,000, and someone was able to break it. Then they said, okay, if you can break the regular knapsack, you can have money. Well, they, someone ended up breaking the regular knapsack as well. And they asked him the question, and says, well, why were they able to break? He says, well, because it sucks. It doesn't work. So it was pretty bad. So that's why it's not actually being used. But it's still a pretty good encryption scheme. It's a pretty good idea. The fact that it doesn't use. It doesn't work. Now we're going to talk about DES. Anybody, anybody know anything about DES? It's an encryption system. Very good. That, good. Good answer. Now, Chris, you can't answer any of these questions. Okay. All right. Let's talk about... I'm not sure if this is all set to do this or not, but oh well, we'll find out. I don't remember if I had the thing. Okay. You all know what symmetric or secret key algorithms are? So what can we what what do we know about that? Are the keys the same or the keys different? Same. Same. Okay. Same key. One key to encrypt, one key to decrypt. Okay, nothing different there. Okay. Okay? So we can encrypt with one key, decrypt another key. So we take our plain text, encrypt it, becomes our cipher text, and then we decrypt it with a key, the same key, and we basically get our plain text back. Okay, nothing new there. Okay, one key per channel. So two times n minus one divided by two. We see that again. So that was on the test. It's going to be on one of the next tests as well. Maybe on both. I'm not sure. Okay, uh, public key algorithms now. Separate key for each. We're going to cover a whole bunch more about them, not so much today, but we're going to cover more about them. Okay. Now we have an encryption key and a decryption key. So the keys are different. Okay. All right. Okay. Can we do that as well? You notice how I swapped the E and the D there at the bottom? Yes. Yes, I could. With asymmetric, as long as I don't mix them up, whatever key I happen to say is the encryption key stays the encryption key forever. You can label them key one and key two. As long as you don't mix them up, you're good. So that would work as well. Okay, two keys per user. So everyone needs two. And we're going to cover a whole bunch more on that here after a while. All right, now let's talk about the secret key. Okay, and secret key are symmetric. We know that. No one should ever get that wrong again, hopefully. All I know is if I hit mute, it mutes the, well, is that coming out here? Yes. Okay, I can turn that off. I just can't turn the other mute off. Okay, so DES. Let's talk about DES, the Data Encryption Standard. Okay. All right. There's other ones out there. We're not going to. You don't have to write these down because we're not covering these yet. But there's Skipjack. There's EES. There's AES, which we will cover. Um, so we have a single key per channel. So one key for encryption and decryption. Okay. Okay, it's secret key only known to A and B, so me and John share the key amongst each other. Okay? Unless someone steals the network. Unless yeah, someone steals it. Okay? So basically, between A and B, we can encrypt with the key, so our plain text becomes ciphertext, and then we use the same key and then decrypt the ciphertext back to plain text again. Okay? So far, so good. Nothing new there yet. We haven't covered anything new yet. Okay? You could do the other way as well. John can send me something by encrypting with the key. Since I have the same key, I can then decrypt. And nothing new there as well. Okay? All right. Some problems. Revealed keys, first of all. If I happen to share my key with somebody, I, so, so me and John got a, a symmetric algorithm between us, and I happen to publish my key somewhere. What do you think? We're done. I mean, it's no longer valid. Okay, key distribution is also a problem. Uh, we're going to cover Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Also, RSA can be used for that as well. So there are ways around that, but still, that is a problem. I still need to get the key to him. Okay. All right. Could be a large number of keys. 
So for me and John to talk, we're talking to Key and um, oh, damn it, you get it. Lewis. Darn it. <laughs> were you off? At Darn all? it, I, I was, oh, I was close. It was, it, I would have been there, man. You were going to say Kevin, weren't you? No, no. It's Jeffrey, Christopher, yeah. It's just Darn it. Lewis, this, and something. It's got an N in it. I knew it. Exactly. So a large number of keys. Okay. Put a cartoon on there. Everybody likes cartoons. Okay. So basically we need encryption. It says, a decree went throughout the land to find a good algorithm. We need a good one. One worthy competitor, com or comp competitor named Lucifer came forward. All right. So that's where we're going to talk about today. Funny you ask that question. We're going to get there in a second. Okay. Basically, does the data encryption standard was based on it's called a Feistel structure. Dr. Horst Feistel, 1915 to 1990. Okay. Basically, it's a structure of a symmetric algorithm where an encryption and decryption are basically nearly the same. They could be the same, actually. Okay. It normally is just a manipulation of the key schedule. That's what a Feistel structures, okay? You're going to hear Feistel a couple different ways, like AES is also a Feistel structure, okay? But it was based on Horst Feistel, okay? So DES is based on the Lucifer cipher. Why was it named the Lucifer cipher? Well, that's the question he asked. Well, the Lucifer cipher was based on the demon algorithm. Does it make sense? You get that? Demon, kind of like the devil. All right. Now, the demon algorithm was just short for a demonstration algorithm. It had nothing to do with the devil. But since when they made the algorithm using APL, it couldn't handle the length of demonstration. See, Feistel and his group made this algorithm as a demonstration that they could do it. And it's one of those deals, a lot of times I'll write a program, we'll call it test. And it stays the name test until I'm done, then they change it to something else. Well, that's what they did. They made an algorithm called demonstration, but in the language they wrote it in, they had to do it in less than, so they basically had to do it in, what, five? Five, five characters. And someone said, ooh, demon, that's kind of like Lucifer. That's how it became Lucifer. So, really had nothing to do with the devil, but it was just a planned word someone did. Okay? Answer your question? Yes, it That would be a great yeah, test question. Test question. I could see a couple questions out of there. Like, maybe like, what language was it written in originally? What language was it Dude, it was right there, APL. You told me not to read it. All right, so let's talk more about it. 1977, NIST certified this thing. And I'll tell you, if you read that book, there's a chapter in it that's just, I'm assuming you read the majority of that chapter, Chris? I haven't gone that far yet. I'm probably only... 30, 40 pages. Okay, very, very interesting chapter. It was really in depth. I highly recommend you read it because great bonus questions come out of that area. Okay. And so, in the last thing, those bonus questions are about 25% of your grade. So, 1977, NIST certified this thing. And if you read about it, it was just a joke that they actually got it certified this way. But, yeah, we'll talk more about that. Okay? It was developed for use by the general public. We needed something that people could use. The government could use, the general public could use, a lot of people could use this thing, so they needed something. Okay? All right? Accepted as a cryptographic standard worldwide. Okay? So everybody in the world is going to use this darn thing. Okay? All right. Has both hardware and software implementations, which is good. Which one's normally faster, hardware or software? Hardware. Hardware. Hardware is always faster because it's made for that specific purpose. Purpose. Software is always, you know, running on top of something else. So you'll see that in one of the tests when we're talking about speed and performance. Hardware is always faster. Just remember that. So when it goes into a rain band, it gets old of it. Yeah, well, pretty much. Okay. Let's talk about the algorithm itself. It's a complex combination of substitution and transposition cipher. It's 64-bit plain text block, 56-bit key, 16-round algorithm. And the same algorithm is used for both encryption and decryption. We're going to cover the algorithm in great, great detail. Every step of it. So don't worry about that. But, so this whole block 
cipher. That's another indication that it's a Feistel cipher, a Feistel algorithm, because it's also a block algorithm. First, we take this block of text, it's 64 bits. We encrypt it. So, we, we talked, remember we talked about stream ciphers and block ciphers way back when? So, does this have high error propagation, low error propagation? Okay, we got one for low, one for high. Yeah. Oh, we got two for low, two for high. Or 50-50. All right, let's think about it. So we have 64 bits, I screw up one of them, what happens to that whole entire block? You ever get a rotten apple in a bag of, a rotten uh, tomato in a bag of tomatoes? Whole darn bag is rotten. Yeah, it's pretty much rot. destroys everything. So you don't grab from the front. Now we have high error propagation. 56 bit. Remember the last lecture I talked about key size? Man, 56 bit. What do you think? Is that good? No. Yeah. Remember we, I showed you graphically yes. the amount of digits in a 56 bit key. I mean, is it better than the Caesar cipher? Yes. Yeah. Yes. How about the veneer cipher? Oh, yeah, or the yes. knapsack? Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's good. But could we have something better? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could. And if you read the book, it's kind of funny because the DES original algorithm was made to work. Out of the box, the way it was written, between 48 and 128 bit. You could select the size you wanted and everything. But the, there's a big old section in the book where they were saying the government basically said you cannot use that. You must shorten the key length because it can't be broken. 128 bit key, you're not going to break it. It's exponentially longer to break. So they ended up going all the way down to 56 bits before the government was happy with it. Another part of the reason is they had to make it fit on a certain chip. Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, anyone ever watched the movie Twenty One? Yep. The uh, card counting mm -hmm. movie. Remember the, the against the card count. Remember they were building that robot. Yep. It's kind of like the sideline story. Mm -hmm. They were talking about how it had to fit on a certain size chip. Mm -hmm. That's part of the issue with this algorithm as well. And they were trying to implement it. And we're talking back in the seventies. Didn't really have quad core machines with gigs of RAM. We basically have the chips that are in our microwaves today. But how, mu how much storage do they have on them? None. Holds the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she holds the time. That's about it. And the problem trying to, I mean, we talk about the size of numbers. Remember we talked to the knapsack, items in the knapsack were two to the two hundredth apart, and the numbers were super huge. Imagine doing math when you can only work with eight bit numbers. If you only have an 8-bit memory space, you can only handle 256 at a time. How are you going to work with, you know, billions and billions of digits? So it is tough. So there's reasons they shortened it. But I recommend reading that book. It's, uh, it goes into real gory detail about that. Okay, so we have the same algorithm for both encryption and decryption. All right. This is kind of what it looks like. This picture sucks, doesn't it? <laughs> Good, because we're not going to follow that one. I just thought it was kind of... That's what we're going to follow. Yeah, that wasn't that pretty much. Okay, <laughs> so let's talk about the algorithm now. Okay, here's the design of it. First, we have the initial permutation. We're going to take something, screw it up. Then we're going to do a bunch of other stuff, then unscrew it up. Okay, but we're going we're to talk about each one of these. So we do the initial permutation. So we mix it up. Then we do something to it 16 times. In each of these 16 cycles, we have what's called a key transformation. So we have our key, but our key is shifted by one bit every time. Okay? So with each 16 cycle, the key is the manipulated, which we'll see how that happens as well. Okay? Then we undo what we did. Okay? So we had our initial permutation, 16 rounds of something. Then we undo what we started with. Okay, that's pretty much how it works. All right? Now let's talk about the cycles themselves, the 16 cycles. We basically split it in half. So we take our 64 bit, we split it in half. Obviously, 64 bit split in half becomes 32. Okay, so we have two halves. Okay? The expansion permutation happens on the right half only. So take the right hand side. Again, I have a graphical picture of this, but we're just going to talk about that. We're going to go through it again. So we take the 32 bits from the right hand side, we expand it from 32 to 48. So we made it bigger. Okay? Then we XOR. We talk about XOR yet in this class? Mm -hmm. Yes or no? Mm -hmm. No? Okay, we will when we get there. But we XOR it with our key. 
but not only our key, our transform key is, the key is going to be changing. Okay? But again, we're only doing with this the right hand half only. Then we run it through a substitution in S box. Again, the right hand side only. And the left hand side is pretty lonely at this place, isn't it? Okay. Then we run it through our permutation box. Again, the right hand side only. And then we take that new right side that we did all this stuff to and we XOR it with our original left side. All right? Then we put them all back together and the right becomes the left and all that stuff. Okay? So let's, let's see a little bit of the graphical picture of what happens here. Okay? So we take our input, which is right over on the top left over there. We take our input, go through our initial permutation, so we do something to it. Okay? Then we divide it in half, so our 64 bits become 32 bits. You notice the right-hand side, we do some stuff to it. The left-hand side, we don't do a darn thing. But the right-hand side, you see, actually becomes the next left. Y'all see that? So a copy of the right gets manipulated, but a copy also becomes the next left. But the right side goes through the key system, the substitution section for the key, the permutation, then we XOR it. Okay? Let's talk about XOR for a second. Um, I shouldn't do this on the screen. Okay. Format, font. Let's go with some Lucidia console. Let's give it a 20. All right. So if I have 11001101, one, one, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, okay, and I put, okay, XORing is one or the other, but not both. So. If I was to draw a line underneath this guy here, and following that rule of one or the other but not both, what happens? So what happens to my first one and zero? It becomes one, because one or the other but not both. That's what X or means. So one and one becomes zero, because I said but not both. Okay, zero, zero becomes zero. Zero, one becomes one. Zero, zero. One, one, one. Everybody see that? One or the other, but not both. Let me make it a little bigger in case you guys can't see in the in the cheap seats. Okay. One or the other, but not both. Tell me this one? What? Correct. So up here in the first one, we have one or zero. So one or the other becomes a one, but not both. So this is the both part. So it becomes zero. Two zeros become zero. Zero one becomes one. Obviously zero zero zero. Again, we get the both. So that's the zero. One or the other so it gives us a one. One or the other gives us a one. One or the other gives us a one. You okay with that? Everybody see how XOR works? Pretty simply there. We get one or the other, but not both. That is called XOR. Okay? All right. So, basically, so this right side, we ran through our substitution item here. Then we went through our permutation box. Then we XOR the results of that with our left side. Okay? Then we started this whole thing all over again. That all became the next right side. So the, the next left side actually was just a copy of the previous right. So that so now we have our new left and our new right. The new left, we don't do a darn thing to it. The new right, we make a copy of that, becomes our next left, and we go so on 16 times. On our 16th time, we XOR them together, like we did right here. So we XOR them together. Okay? Again, the right becomes the left. That was the right. We inverse the initial permutation and we're done. That's all there is to it. Ever see how that works? Kind of, maybe. Think you could like walk through this with a homework assignment? I think you could. Yeah, in the past the homework assignment has gone through about right here. Now, actually, no, it went a little farther. It went through It went through right around here somewhere, didn't it? Yeah. It went through right about this R zero. 
I'm thinking we need to continue on a little bit. Yeah, I'm thinking like through right about here. But I haven't put it up there yet, so. But we'll, we'll walk through it. So. All right. Yeah, every year it gets harder. Before long, you're going to be doing this on, on a napkin. All right. So let's talk about this. Uh, what's this look like to you guys? They've never had the class before. If you have the class, you can't. That's cheating. Oh, come on. Think back. Okay, some of you are not old enough. Those of you that are older, what does this look like? A spirograph. You remember spirographs? Remember that stupid thing? Well, yeah, but still it was the same kind of thing. But I know it's not in a circle, but it was the same kind of thing. All right, so what happens is we take these bits up here. How many bits are there? Take these 64 bits up here and we screw them all up, move them all around. Okay? So what happens to this first bit? Well, he cruises down here, the second bit cruises over here, third bit cruises over there, and so on and so forth. Where do they go? Well, they go right there. So bit one goes to bit, or position, bit in position one goes to position 40. So, so bit one right here. Cruise down here, which happens to be position 40. Okay? So 1 goes to 40, 2 goes to 8, 3 goes to 48, and so on and so forth. Everybody see that? That's the initial permutation. So we just mixed it all up. Okay. With that alone, that's even better than the Caesar cipher. Do you agree? Caesar cipher was just a shift. At least this is the jumble up. So we're already better than the Caesar cipher. All right, so there's our initial permutation. The final permutation, look at this picture right here. Look at that picture. Isn't that the exact opposite? We undo it. Because where did bit 1 go to before? 40. So this one, bit 40, goes to position 1. See that? Bit 2 went to where? 2 went to 8, didn't it? So 8 goes to 2. 3 went to 48, I think. Yeah, there's 48, goes back to 3. So what we really did was we just undid what we did. Okay. Everybody with me so far? Kind of? Somewhat? All right. That's the easy stuff. So what we talked about is the very beginning and the very ending. That's all we did so far. Now let's talk about the cycles themselves. Okay. Where this comes from in the picture is... This part right here. What's happening right on this right hand side? Okay. All right. Let's look here. So we have our 64 bits that have been broken apart already. They went, you know, we went through initial permutation, we broke them apart. Now we have our left 32 and our right hand 32. Okay, on the left hand side, we don't do anything to it. The right hand bit, we have the 32 bit where we expand it to 48. We go through this expansion permutation here to take the 32, bring it up to 48. Why the heck? Anybody? Well, our key is 56 bits. Okay? But really, 8 bits of that key are for parity. Anyone ever heard of what parity is before? Parity is error checking. It's kind of like a CRC check if you ever heard of that kind of stuff. Parity is nothing but error checking. So really, of that 56 bits, we really only have 48 bits that are a key. So really, that 56-bit key is really not 56 anymore. It's really 48. So 48, remember I mentioned, was actually the very minimum key size the disk could support. Remember I said that? 48 to 128. So really that 56 is kind of misleading. So we take our 32, we expand it to 48. Do something with our key. Get that down to 48. The reason we had to expand it is they have to match. I mean, you can't XOR with a different size thing. It wouldn't work. So we get them both 48 here, and we XOR them together. Then we run them through our substitution, or S boxes, and bring that down to 32 bits. Okay? So we take that 48 that came into the S box, bring it back down to 32. Then we through a permutation box right here. Then we XOR it again with our left side. And that becomes the next right side, and the previous right also becomes the next left. Okay? Now let's talk about the key for a second. Key is split in half. It's shifted. 
In other words, transformed, and then it's run through a P-box up there and brought down to 48 bits. Okay? So far, kind of with me? Okay. Could you kind of explain this on the test? You will have to, just so you know. Okay, you will have to somehow explain this. I don't, I don't know if I, in the past the question was on there, but I converted it to multiple choice. I really didn't have it. Maybe I'll do like a matching where you have to put the order that things happen. That'd be cool. That might work. I got to come up with something. Okay, let's talk about the expansion permutation. Okay, this expansion permutation we're talking about is right up here. When the right side 32 bits becomes 48, well, here it is. So 1 goes to 2 and 48. 2 goes to 3 and so on and so forth. Okay? Who may, who thought of this whole algorithm? What's his name? Feistel. Feistel. Dr. what? Feistel. Feistel. Very good. Man, I tried to find a picture of him. I'm pretty sure I got a picture of him. But... I wasn't 100% positive it was him, and I didn't want to give a picture of some other weird dude, so I took him off. Well, all right. So let's do, here's our expansion pin. So bit one, so whatever's in position one goes to position two and 48. Okay? I wrote a Java program to do this. So it was pretty simple. The reason I did that way I could grade your homework much easier. And very simple. Because originally when I taught this class, everybody had to have the same exact problem because it was a pain about the grade. But then I wrote a Java program to grade it automatically, so I could assign each of you a different assignment, and I could still grade it, so it made it quite easy. All right, so bit 1 goes to 2 and 48. 2 goes to 3, 3 goes to 4, 4 goes to 5 and 7, 5 goes to 6 and 8, then 6 goes to 9, 7 and 10, and so on and so forth. These are hard-coded values. Okay. What do you all think about the whole hard-coded thing? Is that good? I don't know. It's like, is there a reason behind it? Yeah, so, here or there. Now let's talk about the S boxes. Okay. All right. Let's go back and look where the S boxes were, just so you get an idea where we're at. We're talking about this S box right here. This whole S box. Remember one from 48 down to 32? All right. I need to put a picture in there again. Okay. So the S box. So, there's a bunch of boxes we'll see on the next page. But, okay. Bits 1 through 6 become 1 through 4. 7 through 12 become 5 through 8, and so on and so forth. Okay? When this was originally submitted to the NSA, they actually rejected it for the way the S-boxes works. They said there was, you're able to predict the output of the algorithm based on the way the S-boxes work. So they actually went in and manipulated the S-boxes to make it so it was a more random output. Some people still think that they did that so there was a back door in it. But you never know. All right. So the S box, remember we went from 48 back down to 32. Okay. And here's what happened to all of them. So let's look. So bits, um, one th what happened to bit 14? It's gone. Thrown in the bit bucket. Happened to bit, uh, row one, bit zero goes in the bit bucket. Row, okay, row 2, bit 15 goes away. Row 3, or actually row 4, bit 13 goes away. See how some of these got zeros on them? So some of the bits are just thrown away. Okay. I haven't wrote the code to do this part yet. I just have to, haven't done it. Now let's talk about the P-Box. Okay. Now, where would the P-Box come from? Let's go back and find it. Okay, P-Boxes, there's actually two of them. So I don't know. We'll have to see. Are we talking about the 48-bit or the... I'm pretty sure we're talking about this one, the 32-bit. Okay. Should be this bottom one. All right. Yeah, we're talking about the bottom one. Okay. So that one, we're just moving stuff around again. Okay. One goes to whatever, and so on and so forth. There they are. One goes to 9, and 2 goes to 17. Okay. So we're just moving stuff around. So that's the one where I can blow the S-box. All right. So now we talked about the S box, we talked about the P box, we haven't talked about this key thing yet. Here's the key shift. Okay, what we're talking about is this shift right up here. This little key shift. I tried to find a better picture than this, I couldn't find one. Alright. On cycle one, the bits are shifted one. 
Cycle 2, they shifted one more. Cycle 3 through 15, they shifted two. And cycle 16, they shifted one. If you ask the question why, well, that's what they decided when they wrote the darn thing. Okay, so that's the key shift. Okay, now the choice permutation, that's below the key where it brings it down to 32 bits. Okay, no. From, fit, from 56 to 48. Okay, you'll see some of the bits are dropped off. Bit 9's dropped off, 18, whatever, you know, 22, 25. These are just dropped off. Okay. Okay, so we're bringing it down from 56 to 48 bit. Everybody with me? Hopefully. All right, so we cover this. We cover this. All right. Don't you love that way it looks? All right, so now the actual encryption algorithm... What does this mean? It means the left side, so, so say j was equal to 5, okay? So L5, in other words, left side round 5 is equal to right, sound, right side round 4. See how that works? Because remember the right copies down to become the next left. So the left 5 is equal to the right 4. Sense to everybody? All right. The right five, okay? So the right five now is equal to the left four. Because remember, the left comes down, gets XORed with the previous right manipulated with the key. So remember that? See how that all works out? I will not ask you this on the test. That's what? Oh, that's XOR. It's the only picture I could find of it. I need to fix that someday. So the right five would become is equal to the left four X word with the right four key four ran through the S box, P box and all that, then X word with the previous left. It's the all this is the picture. Everybody see that? And if you're actually writing code to do this, you would use it in code rather than the picture, obviously. Okay? Okay? Decryption's a little different. Okay? They just changed it slightly. So let's go with the 5 again. So the right 4 is equal to the left 5. Okay? So basically it just swaps it around just, just a hair. Okay? Not much. So your algorithm is nearly identical. Okay? You don't need to memorize that. That's not an issue. Okay? So don't worry about that. Just manipulate it slightly. Again, a Feistel structure, the encrypt and decrypt are basically identical, or could be identical. Only just the key transformation. Okay. Same hardware can be used for encryption and decryption. Basically, just tell it to do this one instead of that one. So. Okay. Keys are submitted in reverse order for decryption. Set of you know, one, two, three, four, five, it goes, you know, five, four, three, two, one. Everybody kind of with me? John, you got all this? You know all this? No, but I'm, I'm close. Is there anybody else with me? Hopefully. Hopefully. Hopefully all are with me. Is this all in that book? Actually, it's in the book, and it explains it quite well. I tell you, if you would read the chapter, I mean, it doesn't talk about how it works. It talks about why they did it. Then it makes sense. It's like, wow, why? now I understand why it's this, you know. And, you know, if you go to the gym, you can read the chapter in about two hours on the elliptical. And I read very slow. How Just, can you read and bounce on an elliptical? Dude, I can run six miles an hour and read. I make the font really big, and you end up reading the same paragraph five times over. Yeah, but I have a and it's like, I know I just read that. But, I have a physical book, though. So. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's a problem. All right. <laughs> you can read the book, but, you know, it's just uh, yeah. easier for the electronic. All right. All right. So there's some problems with it. First of all, the secrecy. Okay. Saying the rationale behind the S boxes. Some people think the NSA kind of put them up to it. And if you read about it, I kind of would agree to it. I agree that they did. Okay. It says the rationale behind the S boxes, the P boxes, and the key transformation was not released. It was basically kept secret. 
Okay, and for the longest time, Des was kept sacred. It's kind of like uh, Windows 8. Some of you have seen Windows 8 preview, I'm assuming. Yeah. Have you seen the code for it? Yet we see the code for Ubuntu and everything else. So this is like Windows 8. There's some parts I don't want you to know. Does that mean it's not good? Does that mean there's a government conspiracy? Not necessarily, but there could be. We don't know. Okay. So the reasoning behind that stuff was not released. The congressional inquiry exonerated the NSA, but yeah, that's part of the government as well. So we really don't know. Okay. Design flaws. It says NSA released information about the S boxes. It says they are not. It says no S box is literally your function of its input. You know, the part that I always pick up on is when I was reading the book about this, they were talking about how they wanted to change, make it so that the input, you can't determine the output based on the input, pretty much. Okay? And they said they had to manipulate so it looked more random. But by just the fact of them manipulating it, uh, I, I'm one of those that, you know, random is a really big deal. Because if you run something, in it, like uh, in my penetration testing class, I assign students, other students, to stock. Okay? And I randomly pick the names. But when I randomly pick them, Susan Curtis, who works in my office, was assigned a student that I couldn't let her do because the student's on my grant and it wouldn't be fair. So I had to do it again. But just the fact that I did it again was it random now. So it's not really random because the first time was really random. So I don't know. The whole deal with random is it's, I don't know, it sucks. Just believe in it. It works. doesn't really work. Okay. All right. So no S-Box is a linear function of its input. All right. We also have diffusion. Changing one S-Box input changes at least two output bits, which is good. We want that. We want, you know, it to just replicate everywhere. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um. Uh, S boxes are chosen to minimize the differences between the number of ones and zeros when any single bit is held constant. What that means is, so if I make a bit stay one or stay zero, whatever, I want to make it so the output is an equal number of ones and zeros. But again, you know, why did they do that? We don't really know. <laughs> okay, so there are some issues behind it. But we're talking, you know, back in the 70s. We had nothing. So. Then we came up with this, and what did we start with? I mean, what, what kind of, you know, previous work did they get to look at? The Caesar cipher? I mean, I, they had other stuff, but, you know, even coming up with the stuff, it's like, wow. Okay? So is the basic of the, the NSA is they wanted to say cipher, but they wanted something that they could encrypt? That's what a lot of people say. You know, back in the 70s, we're thinking about the speed of computers, Obviously, none of us had one. NSA did. They wanted something that, you know, according to the book I'm reading, again, it's everything you read is always different. How long would it take them to break it? So, obviously, with a 128-bit key, it's going to take them forever. But if you can get the key size small enough, and if they had input into the design of it, you know, the NSA never really, I mean, they told them a few small things to change, but... What if they were changing it to make it easier for them? We don't know. But that's what a lot of people think. That's why, you know, uh, when, we start, when we get into PGP and stuff like that, it's like the government was pissed. It's like you get something that can't be broken now. What the heck good is that? It's even AES. When you get into AES with original cipher, you know, that is can't be broken. That we know of. I mean, that we know of. So. But a lot of people think the NSA did that so that they could break it. All right, the number of iterations, okay? Are 16 rounds sufficient? Okay. Uh, is anyone a car dealer in here? I was a car dealer. I used to work with a guy in the Air Force. He was a professional dealer from Vegas. The dude could take a deck of cards and shuffle them really good, and he'd, and he'd take one single card in his hand. He goes, all right, see this card? He says, yeah, he goes, all right, here, take it. Hands it to you, and you're never going to get it. I don't care how many times you never get the card he hands you. It's like, I got it. I still don't know how he does. He was really good at this. Stuff. But point is, how many times do you need to shuffle cards before they're shuffled? They say three to four times is all it really takes to shuffle cards. Well, uh, 
but they're saying here eight cycles was sufficient. So if eight was sufficient, by doing it 16, did we just undo what the eight did? So now it's back to the beginning? I don't know. I'm just speculating here. I don't know. But why did we do that? So it says, experiments indicate eight cycles are sufficient to eliminate, eliminate any observed dependence. So are we wasting time? Are we making it twice as slow? Do they want to make it so it took twice as long to break? You know, I don't know. Okay. All right, key length. Okay. The original algorithm had up to 128-bit key. This is a 56-bit key. Okay. So at 10 keys per second, it would take 228 million years. Okay. One key per whatever, that nanosecond or something, it would be 2,280 years. Okay. Parallel attack, they said 106 chips, each testing one key per nanosecond would require 20 hours for a brute force attack. So back then in the 70s, a, a $50 million machine would cost $20,000 per solution. Think about it. If you're a foreign government, a bad guy, or even our government, that's pretty darn cheap to get a solution. 20000 bucks is all it would cost to get a solution if you really wanted one. Okay. Okay. 97, okay, took 128 days, uh, basically now with 35,000 machines, it only take 12 days, okay. 98, uh, basically get down to it, point of 99, they broke deads in 22 hours and 15 minutes using deep crack supercomputers and uh, 100 PCs. They were at 20, 256 billion keys per second. So basically it's too quick now, too easy to break. Because the whole point is brute force. That's too quick. Yeah. <laughs> well, and if we're talking about something that's very important, yes, that's too quick. You know, something, if you can break something in you know, 22 hours, we're talking under a day. Yeah, but how are you going to get 100,000 supercomputers? I think you can. Okay. But, you know, you know Moore's Law? The speed of the computer doubles every 18 months. So uh, what are we at? That's less now. What now? I think it's less yeah, now. it's like every 18 minutes, I think. Seems to be, but every 18 releases of Apple software, which is about every 18 minutes. <laughs> okay. Every so, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, every yeah, Firefox <laughs> releases. Exactly. <laughs> every hour. But the point <laughs> is, it can be broken. Yeah. Brute force is, y'all know what brute force is? Okay, yeah, if I got a thousand keys, I'm going to stand outside door and try every key. It's going to take a while. But if I only had 10 keys, Obviously, I could do it a lot faster. Okay. Whole point with brute force, that's to try every possible key combination. Does that mean you're always going to get it on the last try? No, you might get it on the first try. You don't know. So you could do it in 15 minutes instead of 22 hours in 15 minutes. But that's, you know, the time. So. All right. They will not recertify it. Okay. All right. Let's talk about some more weaknesses. Compliments. Okay. So... Basically, it says the complement of the keys would do it. Okay, take the complement of the plain text, the complement of the key, end up with the complement of the ciphertext. For me, I was like, who cares? But the fact that it does it is an issue. Okay, just the fact that it does come up with something. In other words, you're predicting the results. If you can predict the results, there's a problem with it. Class what? Is that a class NP? Well, NP would be you could actually. Guess the answer and verify that's the answer. But this is just kind of a, yeah, yeah, it's weird. Okay, weak keys, okay? All right. So, keys for which, when we encrypt our plain text with a key, and basically the same key is generated for each round. In other words, keys that are not good keys, okay? It's like, um, kind of like using password one. What's wrong with that? Yeah, I mean, the majority of people use that. I think password one with a capital P is the number one business password right now. That's considered a weak key. And one, two, three, four. Okay. So, weak keys is an issue. Okay. So this occurs when each key half consists of only zeros or ones. Well, if you make, you know, uh, it's funny because you, know, you all have student IDs. You all know what they are. They're pretty, they're random, not really random, but they're incremented with each person. Mine's 17. Okay. All zeros and 17. Okay. But you consider it a very weak student ID. Or, uh, 
just how it's put in the system, the 17th person. What can you do? So, There's mine no is a whole bunch of zeros. So I have a very weak student ID. If you're trying to break mine and you started at the beginning, you'd be getting me first. Not first, but pretty darn close to first. Okay. So now all we got to do is figure out your birthday so you can get in. Y'all know my birthday. <laughs> 9 11, dude. It was my birthday before the world blew up. Yeah. That's not my password for anything, so it's not going to do you much good. Only for students. Oh. Yeah, only for students. So, how do you celebrate your birthday? It's awesome. Man, for many years after that, everybody was always depressed. There was no crowds anywhere. I was always glad. It was <laughs> my birthday well, first. Well, glass half full, huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Also, semi weak keys. Okay? Basically, what they're talking about here is so if we have something that we take our plain text and encrypt it with a key. Okay? Okay? And then we also encrypt it with a different key and get the same result. So if I get encrypted with a different key and get the same ciphertext, is that good? No. Probably not. Okay. In other words, multiple keys can decrypt the message. I wouldn't want that. It's kind of like saying multiple people can get into my house or something, you know? Not a good thing. Okay. So we know three of the weaknesses so far. They are complements, weak keys, and semi-weak keys. So you really understand what some weaknesses are. And there are questions on weaknesses. I mean, yeah, you might see these again. Something maybe like the titles. titles, maybe you could understand. You know, oh, I've seen that somewhere before. Okay, it's like compliments and weak keys and semi-weak keys. Okay. Well, I'm not done yet. I'm just telling you where we're at so far. Okay. Let's look at some weak keys. Left half is zero, or right half is all zeros, or all ones, or zeros and ones, or ones and zeros. Basically, it's like password one, a bad key. You wouldn't want to use that. But just because you wouldn't want to use it, doesn't mean no one will ever use it. I have so many people around here, uh, especially faculty. See, adjuncts have an issue. Adjuncts gets their passwords reset, just like you guys do. But it gets set to something different. Well, every semester theirs gets reset. And if they want to get in, they have to come to campus and reset it, just like y'all do. The problem is they don't want to drive it. So they'll call in and say, Ken, will you reset my password for me? Increment it by one. So, so many people do that, and it's like, they increment it by one, one digit. It's like password one becomes password two. <laughs> and, you know, that's very secure. So, you know, it's kind of like this. Two chances to get to them. Exactly. Two chances. Yeah. All right. All right, again, there's some semi weak keys we talked about. Yeah. Just kind of repetition through here. A key that's like, what's your password? One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, that kind of stuff. What was that password of the guy that I talked about on Google? It was one, two, three, four, five recently? Some big president of some country, Somalia or one of them countries. His password was one, two, three, four, five. Hey, I have that password too. Yeah. Honestly, All right. <laughs> Space balls. All right. Some more weaknesses, design weaknesses. It says expansion permutation repeats first and four bits for every four bit series, crossing bits from neighboring four bit series. Remember, we taught you saw there was like certain bits went over, and it was like, why did they do that? Okay. Maybe when they were designing it, did you ever design something and said, what the heck did you do that for? He's probably doing that in speed. I don't know, like it was that. kind of cool looking, you know? I wanted to make it look like a spirograph or something, you know? Or a darn spider ran across my paper, so I. Went to get them and I don't I like know. Okay. All right. <laughs> S box four derives the last three outputs the same way as the first by complementing some of the input bits. Okay. So there's some design weaknesses. So two different but carefully chosen inputs to an S box can produce the same output. We never want that. It's kind of like saying. So I could come up with two different passwords that produce the same MD5 hash. Would that be good? No. No two things should produce the same hash. Here we have something that does. So we have design weaknesses. Key clustering. So two or more keys produce the same encryption. We already talked about that a little bit. But, okay. In addition, the semi keys are also key clusters. So we also have two, two keys that produce the same thing. Okay. So 
So we have what five weaknesses so far? I think. Okay. Oh, there's more. Differential cryptanalysis. It's a powerful code-breaking technique. Yes. Okay. It says use the carefully selected pairs of plain text with subtle differences to find out what happens. Okay. So basically, we take our plain text. We change specific items to see what happens in the output. Okay? Okay? We talked about how many different tests it would take to do it and all that different stuff. But you now, what they're talking about is you, know, you can do it. And that's actually how a lot of people tested this. They would sit there using differential cryptanalysis. Here's the input, here's the output, and try to figure out how that happened so you can see what changed. Okay? So obviously, they went out recertified. We talked about that already. Okay? We're almost done. I think we're on the last slide. DES is weak. You all agree with that? It's like Caesar Cipher weak. Not quite, but it's close. In today's day and age, with the computers we have, I'd say, yeah, it's close to Caesar Cipher. Okay. Okay, so what if we were to take two 56 bit keys back to back? What if I was to take something, encrypt it with a 56 bit key? Grab that result, then encrypt it with another 256 or another 56-bit key. Wait, wait. No. No. So basically, we take our message, encrypt it with a key, then take that result, encrypt it with another key. Isn't it twice as strong? No. It's not. Okay. 56-bit key is two to the 56. Y'all remember that? So is two, 256 bit keys equal to two to the 112? No. no, it's just two to the 57th. That's all it is. It's two to the 57th. Just think about it. If I encrypt my message with key one that's 56 bit long, then the difference between two to the 56th, okay, okay, two to the third. Everybody know what two to the third is? Mm. Two times two times two. No more topic. I don't know what it is. That's two times two times two. I don't know. Okay, let's just go with two to the second. No, two squared is what? That's two hundred. That's two times two is four. Oh, that's two hundred. So two times three would be eight. I mean, two to the third would be eight. Okay. So two 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 to the two is four. So two to the three is eight. It's twice as much, isn't it? So two to the fifty seventh is twice as much as two hundred fifty six. You got that? So. If I encrypt it with two keys, two two fifty-six bit keys, it's not two to the hundred twelve. It's just two to the fifty-seven. Is, is it better? Doubled. Yeah. But is it double? No. And we're going to talk about triple des later, and we'll see how that works. Actually, encrypts with one key, then decrypts with a different key, then re-encrypts with the first key all over again, depending on which which way you do it. But. So it's a little bit different. All right.